Now, uh, my one question, the one thing that has popped in my mind as we go to Congressman Paul is that uh, Tim and I talk politics all the time, and I say, well, I, I don't know, I don't know. You know why I don't know? Because I'm not being given all the information. The mainstream media, which, by the way, I'm ashamed to say I'm in, uh, I think is not given Congressman Paul a fair shake. I think they're scared of him. I think there's something that he knows that would alter the destiny of the United States of America. So I said to myself, if he would call, then unlike the other media in this country, he has whatever he wants to say. Congressman Paul, can I say good morning to you, sir? Good morning. Nice to be with you today. I uh, am honored that you you came on our show today. So here we are. We have a biased media. There's no question it's a biased media. And I sat there watching the debate. Brian Williams, did he know you were there? <laughs> right? I'm sitting there going, hey, 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 why don't you let Ron speak? He's a doctor. He's a congressman. He, why, why don't we hear what he's got to say? So... This is going to be your time for however much time you can give us. And w what what is Ron Paul, and I have some individual questions that have been called in by our listeners, what is it that they don't want you to say, uh, Congressman? You know, one thing is consistent, regardless of which debate it is, I always get the least amount of time. <laughs> so um, I think they don't want to uh, have uh, the power structure exposed, you, you know, whether how the, how the lobbyists run things in Washington, how the two parties are essentially alike, how the foreign policy is designed not for America but for international affairs and, and maintenance of a, of a global empire. I don't think they want the, the Federal Reserve exposed on how they uh, take care of the special interests. I think one of the big things that is the toughest one is – you know, there's a lot of people who have bleeding hearts and they want to help the poor people, so they devise this, you know, the welfare state and redistribution to be fair and equitable. And I understand their motivation, but what they don't understand, and if they did, they wouldn't take this position. Once you set the stage for redistributing wealth to help a certain group, somebody else is going to use that principle to enrich themselves. In other words, if you have a housing program to give houses to poor people, you end up enriching you know, the mortgage people, the derivatives people, and, and we allow them to go bankrupt and bail them out at the same time. People don't get their houses. But the principle of redistribution usually helps the wealthy. And this is something that, you know, I think I learned more about how it worked after I got to Washington because I always thought, oh, that's welfare, so bad, so bad, not realizing the big welfare is for the corporate giants, not the corporations that make money honestly, but the ones who are in bed with government, the military-industrial complex and these other groups. Now it's the medical-industrial complex, and it's, it's, uh, it's, all, it's all about power and very little to do with protecting liberty, and I don't think they want to hear that story. Well, liberty is a, is, is a key word, and we saw the State of the Union address last night. I have to admit, I could only take so much. And maybe that's not just Barack Obama, who I think is probably, this is my personal opinion, the worst Democratic president in my lifetime. Um, not the worst president, but the worst Democratic president. I would not vote for him, and I've been trying to learn things about you. You know, I listen to Alex Jones, and Alex is a friend of the show. And, and I listen to him talk, and I listen to other people talk. And I say, I said, well, Ron, uh, Congressman Paul has all these incredible things to say. When the heck are we going to see it? And that's why I want to give you the rest of this time. You know, what do you want to get out to the American people uh, that they're just not letting you say, uh, Mr. Paul? Well, we could start in, in many different areas. I, I think uh, the monetary issue is a, a very big issue, and that's what I've talked about so long, and I was motivated to get involved in politics because I, I saw it being a corrupt system. Uh, it's, uh, it's unbelievable that grown-up people who call themselves economists and smart politicians believe that if you need money, you just print pieces of paper and write numbers on it or just use a computer and create billions and billions of dollars or now trillions of dollars uh, to take care of their friends. And this is one area where I think we've made some progress in spite of uh, – you, you know, uh, the, the coverage I've been getting at the debates, because more people are talking about it, more people know about the Federal Reserve. So that's a big issue, but it's much more complicated 
uh, than a lot of people realize on on how it punishes the poor and enriches the rich and and the and the special interest. But that's an ongoing thing, and uh, the very powerful people uh, do not want an audit of the Federal Reserve. They can deal in trillions of dollars. We don't know exactly where, when. We don't even know if we have gold. We don't know whether they loaned the gold out or sold the gold. And they do not allow auditing of the of the Federal Reserve. And that, to me, is a big issue. The other one is is the foreign policy, uh, and, and this is where I'm more challenged. And I understand uh, why people get uh, get a little bit concerned. But I don't think our foreign policy is designed for national security. I think it's designed to protect a world empire, which undermines our national security. Uh, for instance, the wars we fight aren't constitutional because we don't declare them. We don't know exactly who the enemy is. We don't know why we're there. We end up in nation building and being policemen of the world. costs a lot of money. A lot of lives are lost. And then this cost, in the last 10 years, it was about $4 trillion of added debt uh, burden. And this undermines our economy at home. So. Uh, if we have a weak economy at home, no matter how much, how many weapons you have, it's not going to work if you, if you run out of wealth. And that's what's happening right now. The wealth is disappearing, and uh, the jobs have gone overseas. And everything we have today now is debt-based. Uh, the money is debt-based. And debt can't be wealth. And yet the world's still hoping it is, and they're trusting it. They still want to use the dollar. But, you know, just recently there was an indication that the Indian, uh, India, and um, Iran exchanged gold for oil, and this undermines the dollar, and this is a great threat to the internationalists who have to protect the dollar system. And, you know, Iraq was threatening to do that as well, uh, Libya too. So countries that want to undermine the power of the dollar can get themselves into trouble. And uh, that is that is something that deserves a lot more attention than, the, than it's getting. Yeah, this is something I've wanted to ask you since you brought up a foreign policy. And that's where your detractors say, oh, no, 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 we're going back to FDR. We're going to be isolationists. And then Pearl Harbor is going to happen again. Well, we're not isolationists. And 9-11 happened. Now, uh, this is the doc show on the Big A-10 AM Orlando. And we have uh, Congressman Ron Paul, the man nobody lets talk. And I think he's a fascinating guy. Iran, since you brought up foreign policy, do you, have you seen or heard or anybody told you for there's a reason we need to poke a stick in the eye of Iran? Why are we over there with battleships? We're ready to start World War III, the president of peace, right? Not happening. We're ready. To, we just brought the boys back from Iraq. Now we've got to send them to Iran. I don't buy it. Why? And what do you, Congressman Paul, if anything, think we should be poking a stick in the eye of Iran? No, we, we shouldn't be doing that, and it's, and it's about oil. It was about oil in 1953. This, this fight with Iran started in 53. They had an elected leader in 53, and he wanted to ma retain some of the oil profits for the Iranian people, and he bucked Britain and the United States that we overthrew that government put in the Shah, which lasted until 1979. So it's an ongoing fight. It's about oil and power. Who's going to run the oil fields? And there's a Shiite, a Sunni fight over there. The Saudis are Sunnis, and they hate the Persians. And and so there's a religious battle going on. But uh, it's it really has to do with with oil. Uh, so. Uh, Instead of doing what China, China is actually more capitalistic than we are. They produce, they sell us goods, they save their money, and they invest in Iran and Afghanistan, all through Africa. So they're making great progress buying natural resources. And we're out there exhausting ourselves, consuming our wealth, fighting wars to maintain these supply lines. It's mercantilism uh, in a modern sense that you have to have these supply lines and you have to own this oil and control every dictator. And I think it's it's deeply flawed. And uh, so if they get angry at us for being over there, then they have to come up with an excuse of why do they want to kill us. And so they came up with this idea, oh, they want to kill us because we're free and prosperous. Well, we're getting less prosperous and less free, and they still would like to kill us. But uh, th their reaction is a natural re reaction to people who come into their country and bomb their people kill a lot of innocent people, and they, they want to get us off their land. And uh, the D Department of Defense has confirmed this. Our CIA has confirmed this. Our 9-11 Commission has confirmed this. So the evidence is very, very strong. 
but the I imagine the large majority of American people say, well, this is a religious war. Uh, Islam is an evil religion, and they only want to kill us uh, because of their religion, and uh, they don't like us because we're free and prosperous. Well, over over the many years, I've practiced medicine with many Muslim doctors, and they're very decent people. Believe me, they enjoy being free and prosperous. And and uh, this whole idea that it's part of that religion that wants to do it, I think it's a reaction to us being in their country. That's why I try to get people to think, how would we react if somebody came and did that to us? What if the Chinese came in and occupied the Gulf of Mexico and controlled the oil in the Gulf of Mexico? We'd be pretty darn annoyed, and yet that's what we do in the Persian Gulf. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it'll end, and I'm, I'm going to win this argument, but not because I'll be persuasive, but it'll because we're going broke. And that's coming close. That can come up. Uh, the de- destruction, of, the total destruction of the dollar can occur any time. It could occur in a month or a year or ten years. But when it comes, the whole thing comes down on our heads, just like it did on the Soviet system. They had to retrench, and they were dissolved, and the empire fell apart. So uh, I'm trying to avoid that because if you end up with that, you're going to have political chaos in our streets and a lot of violence, and we should work hard to try to avoid that. Now, I'm one of those people that will say I think Islam is an evil religion. I read uh, Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. Uh, you know, I was in radio when they took the hostages. So, yeah, maybe I bought a lot of that, you know, that I was being fed. I don't know why they took those hostages. I understand the oil thing. That's why the first Gulf War happened. It was because of the invasion of Kuwait. <laughs> Everyone thought, uh, Congressman Paul, that we were over there to liberate Kuwait because we love Kuwait. Well, that was not the reason the first <laughs> Bush went in there, sir. Right. It's, it's about it, it's about oil. But, you know, uh, it, I'm not trying to make the case that there is no violent uh, people who use uh, the Islamic religion and become jihadist and, and very, very dangerous. I, I, I know that's the, the, the case, but to indict the whole religion, you know, there's been a few things done in the name of Christianity that has been rather violent, too, yes. over the centuries. Matter of fact, even if it's a century or even a thousand years old, uh, other parts of the world, like the Islamic world, will will remember remember those things. So uh, I, I think religion so often is used uh, to ferment and to uh, get people excited and, and really motivate people to fight, but usually it's for some other reason that the fight is occurring. He is Congressman Ron Paul. He's the one everybody's scared of. Question, I got two more questions for you that have all been submitted by listeners today, and I appreciate that is, um, okay, you know that the uh, the blockade is going on. Brian Williams, by the way, very disappointed in Brian Williams, a very funny human being and very good at what he does. I don't know why that he decides to just act like you're not there. What is the correlation? What has politics and the media got to do with each other? Remember when it was independent? Remember Richard Nixon? You know, the media's job was to make sure that politicians were honest, and now it looks like they're all in bed together. Yeah, well, you know, there's the the large media outlets are frequently in the business of manufacturing weapons, too, and they have to have, and they're an arm of the government, so we talk about the military-industrial complex. Frequently, you can say the military-media-industrial complex uh they they depend they they depend on either protection uh, through licensing or uh making money getting contracts from the government so it's it's a it's a real mess government has become an auction auctioning off of stolen goods which was has been said in the past and therefore everybody's involved in this auction what are they going to get and what can they keep rather than the government there to preserve the marketplace and contract rights and and property they're in there taking from one and then auctioning off and seeing who has the most power. So it does, it, the natural consequence will be that the people who are most rewarded are very, uh, uh, very powerful, very wealthy lobbyists. I mean, uh, it, it's a natural consequence. If you had nothing to auction off, uh, the only people who go to Washington would be to refine and improve upon personal liberty and the protection of property rights and our First Amendment rights. So, Government doesn't. Uh, the governments won't intrude in on our on our personal freedoms. I think that uh, you and I agree on especially one issue, the most important issue of all. You'd like us to stop being in other people's business. What about America? America is broken, Congressman Ron Paul. It's broken. How do we pull out of all the nonsense that we're involved in right now and fix? When I see a homeless guy. 
and I see him just, man, all he wants is a dollar. I'm thinking, nobody cares about this guy. We're too busy worried about what's going on in the Persian Gulf, or we're worried about this, or this person, we got a blockade, they're not giving us oil. When are we going to look after ourselves? That's really what you believe in. Right, and, and you have to ask a basic question, what should the role of government be? And if it's to police the world and run a welfare state, you're going to have more homeless, and you're going to have more wars until we totally go broke. But if you're spending a trillion dollars a year, which you are overseas, uh, if that money were to be returned to the people and spent, maybe there'd be more jobs here doing productive work. But when you build a bomb and you send it over and you drop it on somebody, uh, there was no increase in the standard of living here. That was taken out of somebody's medical care or somebody's educational benefits or who knows what. It would have been differently distributed. So it's, it's a loss uh, when it's taken out. So you have to change this whole concept of what the role of government ought to be. But right now we're in a mess because we did it for so long and we are bankrupt. We won't admit it. We're just look, all they're doing today is finding out who's going to suffer the most, who's going to get the bad debt. And right now the people are losing and they're losing their jobs and you see more people in the street because the wealthy who made all this money when the bubble was being formed by the Federal Reserve, they were making money off the derivatives. They went bankrupt and then they got bailed out. Uh, so the, the whole thing has to be reversed. The most important thing is to quit the bailing out, get the tax code different, get it down, get the regulations out of the way, make the conditions right so that people will bring their capital back to this country, get wages in the free market so that, uh, so that we can be more competitive again. But we can't, we're not very competitive right now, and, and that is our big problem. And you really can't do that unless you uh, change the monetary system uh, right now. We're sort of on. Uh, we're sort of addicted to easy money. People are still taking it, so it's much easier for us to print money and buy stuff, go further into debt than it is to reform. But eventually, when they give up on the dollar, we'll have to reform, and then uh, capital would have to come out of savings. The whole system would change. But right now, uh, we're suffering the consequence of a of a rule that has been written by the Austrian economists that when you destroy a currency, you destroy the middle class. That's what we're doing. The middle class is shrinking, they're getting poorer, and the wealthy are getting wealthier. And this is a characteristic of monetary destruction. What does President Ron Paul do with the IRS? Well, of course, we don't need it. We shouldn't have it. We should repeal the 16th Amendment just as how can you do it and how fast you can do it. Uh, that would be the goal that we should have. We lived without it before 1913. And that should be. But in the meantime, you should get taxes down as, as low as possible. You should uh, rein in the uh, IRS. I don't think anybody should be considered guilty until they prove themselves innocent. And I don't like uh, any administrative uh, body, executive branch, writing, writing regulations because that's unconstitutional. Only Congress could do this. So, uh, but once again, it's back. Uh, the, the IRS is the symptom of big government, a big government we can't afford and we don't have enough money for, so they keep squeezing and squeezing, but there's not much left to squeeze anymore. What do people know uh, uh, the difference? What do people need to know? What would you like to tell them the difference between private banking, public banking, the Fed, and are we all being hosed? Has this been going on our whole lives? Yes, and it, it was designed and, and, uh, and uh, put together by the bankers to protect the bankers to be the uh, lender of last resort. But when they are guaranteed, uh, you know, the bailouts, that causes the moral hazard they don't worry about. And there's always the government there to be the lender of last resort, to always to have the insurance, and they do the gambling. And then they put the derivatives into the banking system. I like deregulation and free market banking, but I didn't vote. Uh, you know, to allow them to put the uh, uh, derivatives into the banks because they were guaranteed that they'd get bailed out again under FDIC and other programs. So, uh, free market banking would mean if you if you don't follow the rules and you go broke, you go broke, and you and you get it out of the system rather rapidly, and the people would become more alert to what they're doing instead of saying, oh, the government's going to take care of me. And I hate to uh, interject, but if, if you have one more quick question, I might be answered, but i got to run. Oh, no, no. Last question. Um, and it, it has to do, and I appreciate this. This is Congressman Ron Paul. He's here in Florida. He's got things to do. So i got one more question. I think the one question that's on everybody's mind. How, in God's name, do we get out of this mess with Iran, with President Ron Paul, and how do we just settle down the Middle East so we don't have to worry about it anymore? 
Well, I think the approach ought to be completely different. It shouldn't be by force and intimidation initiating uh, acts of war. A, a blockade and prevention of the, uh, the Iranians to sell their oil is an act of war. We wouldn't tolerate it if they did it to us, and we should quit doing that. And uh, we, we shouldn't keep uh, threatening them that if they don't do this and this, we're going to bomb them. They've broken no laws. Uh, they probably are working on a nuclear weapon. Even Ehud Baruch, uh, the uh, defense minister of Israel, said, well, if I were an Iranian, I'd probably want a nuclear weapon too. So we have to try to understand this. But, uh, you, you know, and even the Israelis say that if he gets a weapon, if Iran gets a weapon, it's not an existential threat. We put up with 330,000 nuclear weapons with the Soviets. We were able to contain them. The whole approach has to be different. We shouldn't be so intimidated that we're willing to start a war over a weapon they don't have. Uh, I think the approach would be completely different. You, we ought to... Uh, I think we actually could work to the day where uh, they wouldn't even have the desire to have a nuclear. Their greatest motivation for a nuclear weapon is because they're surrounded by, by nuclear weapons and they're being threatened continuously. So I think it, it's a change in attitude. We used diplomacy when we had to deal with Khrushchev. I don't know why we can't use diplomacy when we have to deal with the Iranians at this time. I'm going to let you go. Uh, you have been an absolute uh, delight to have on the air. I'd like to... You know, I, I want you to consider yourself a friend of the Doc Show. Very good, and I thank you. Thank you, sir. There he is. Okay. Congressman Ron Paul. He got his 20 minutes that nobody else will give the guy. When you listen to him talk, he sort of makes sense. I want to hear what you think. 407-774-0810. Yes, I wanted to ask about his son, Rand. Yes, I wanted to ask about the TSA incident because uh, I'm against the TSA. I wanted to ask, sure, I wanted to ask about what do you think about Obama locking us all down, holding the Internet hostage, putting the TSA on streets. I got to the best ones I could. But that was Ron Paul, and he's only on the big 8, 10 a.m. He won't do other interviews. Don't buy people that are playing audio clips of Ron Paul. He was live. I think he made some great points. And I know more about Ron Paul right now than I ever did before. You're listening. To Orlando, local and live, the weapons of mass discussion. It's the Doc Show right here at the Big 8, 10 a.m. In a big country.